Okay, no, sir. We are live. Assalamu alaikum. I'm a vision to watch you, Yes. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> we are meeting again at the Mir Muinul Haq Memorial Lecture Series. This series is number 10. <clears throat> this is it. series is being conducted by our organizers participating from different part of the globe. Welcome to all the audiences and guests. <clears throat> You all know the organizers of this technical session are Nazim Ahmed, Murtuza Ahmed Chishti, Manwar Ahmed, Jashimuddin, and our Zoom video administrator, Kazi Azizir Rahman. They are all doing a great job organizing all these sessions. <clears throat> this is Naz Hussain joining from Houston, Texas. As you all know, this lecture series is carried out every month in honor of Mir Muinul Haq Masood, who spent all his professional life in geological exploration in Bangladesh. The lecture series in, is an integral part of remembering Masood and uh, carrying out his devotion of exploration geology. This technical session is providing knowledge and awareness among the geoscientists in the field of exploration geology in Bangladesh. We had so far nine lecture sessions in geotechnical subjects. All these sessions have given us very important information on Bengal Basin. This will be helpful for current geology professionals, research students, those who are pursuing higher educations. We have all the lectures saved in our YouTube site for the benefit of the students and research professionals. I have re-entered the link in the WhatsApp group. You can save for your future reference. Today's lecture will be on turbidites, new exploration tech target, in Bangladesh, Bengal Basin and 3D modeling of turbidites, a case study from New Zealand. The keynote speaker will be Dr. Mohammad Aminul Islam, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of Geosciences, University of Brunei Darussalam. Along with him, we have guest speaker, Dr. M. Zuleh, Zalaluddin, Zalalud Rahman, I'm sorry, Professor of Geological Sciences at the Jahangir Nagar University. We will have Monwar Ahmed as moderator for this session today. Monwar is an ex-consultant, BAPEX, geoscience specialist at Kuwait Oil Company. Our regular moderator, Jashimuddin, got a night off. Once again, thank you for all for joining the session. I now hand over to Manwar. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Uh, today we have very interesting uh, topic to, to be discussed. And before that, before inception of that uh, session, over the last one month, we lost a couple of our geoscientists. One is Dr. Mr. Reza Rafi. And another is our ex colleague, uh, Amin Islam, Sheikh Amin Islam. So we have a couple of shop uh, uh, in Bangla and condolence notes. The first one will be for Mr. Rafi, Rafi, for Mr. Rafi, and it will be read by our friend Nazi Mahmoud. I am Nazim Ahmed speaking from Calgary, Canada. This is the condolence note for Reza Rabbi. 
আমরা জনাব রাজা রাব্বির মৃত্যুতে গভীর শোক প্রকাশ করছি তিনি ভূতত্ত্ব বিভাগের উনিশশো সনের মাস্টার্স বেসের ছাত্র ছিলেন প্রয়াত মীর মইনুল হক সর্বজনাব নাজ হুসেন ফরিদ উদ্দিন ডক্টর ইসমাইল প্রমুখ তার সহপাঠী ছিলেন তিনি ভূতত্ত্ব ডিগ্রির পর জেন্স ফিনলি মালিকালাদিন চা বাগানে কর্মজীবন সূচনা করেন ভূতত্ত্ব বিষয়ে তার একাগ্রতার কমতি তখনও ছিল না তার সহপাঠীরা যখন ভূতাত্ত্বিক জরিপে সিলেট অঞ্চলে যেতেন তিনি তখন তাদের বিভিন্ন সেকশনের সঙ্গে সঙ্গ দিতেন স্বাধীনতার পর উনিশশো সালে তিনি মার্কিন যুক্তরাষ্ট্রের অধিবাসী হন সেখানে তিনি চোদ্দই অক্টোবর দুই হাজার একুশে মৃত্যুবরণ করেন আমরা তার পিদিয়ে আত্মার শান্তি কামনা করছি তার সহমনবিন্দ অক্টোবর তিরিশ টু থাউজেন্ড টোয়েন্টি ওয়ান এবার রেজা রাব্বি আমি একটু অ্যাড আই লেট মি অ্যাড এ লিটল বিট হি ওয়াজ এ ভেরি গুড ফ্রেন্ড অফ মাইন্ড উই ইউজ টু বি ইন টাচ ওয়াইড হি ওয়াজ উই আর ইন ইন নিউ ইয়র্ক and um he always used to ask about masood how is masood doing and when masood was sick and uh, he was uh, he lost his all his memories and uh, he used to say i try to call him nobody is picking up and at the end he about a year back he was telling me that naz i think i am uh, forgetting everything i cannot remember things so um later i realized that he is not calling me anymore about a year later I called him at his phone. His wife picked up. He said that uh, he has lost memory. He, he went to complete dementia. Now he had a heart attack. He's in the hospital and I'm going to the hospital right now. And then after three days, I called and she said, I am again going to the hospital and um, he is not in good shape. Two days later, he passed away. And it was very sad that he passed away with the same disease that masood had thank you uh, now i will request amir rafin to read out the uh, condolence note for sheikh amir islam amir rafin assalamu alaikum ami ashole aminul islam sheikh aminul islam uni amari batchmate chilen শেখ আমিনুল ইসলাম যিনি ছিলেন আমাদের অনেকের কর্মজীবনের সাথী শ্রদ্ধাস্পদ এবং প্রিয় বন্ধু আমরা গভীর বেদনার সাথে তার মৃত্যুতে শোক প্রকাশ করছি অক্টোবর তেইশ হেমন্তের সকালে তার প্রিয়তমা স্ত্রী এক ছেলে এক মেয়ে সহ অগণিত শুভানুধেই রেখে চিকিৎসক ও আত্মীয়জন শেষ প্রচেষ্টা ও আমাদের সকলের হৃদয়ের একান্ত আকর্তি সত্ত্বেও তিনি চলে গেলেন পরপারে তিনি কর্মজীবনের শুরু করেছিলেন পেট্রো বাংলার ল্যাবরেটরিতে কর্মসূত্রেই ভূবিজ্ঞান পেশার প্রতি অনুরাগ জন্মে তার বিদেশি বিশেষজ্ঞদের সাথে নিয়মিত ভূতাত্ত্বিক কার্যক্রমে তিনি অংশগ্রহণ করতেন তাদের একান্ত প্রচেষ্টা এবং আগ্রহে তিনি ভূতত্ত্ব বিভাগে অধ্যয়ন করেন আর এই সূত্রে তিনি হয়ে যান পরিচিত হন সকলের বড় ভাই হিসেবে কাজের প্রতি তার নিষ্ঠা কর্তব্য পরায়ণতা সততা তাকে বৈশিষ্ট্যমন্ডিত করে তোলে তিনি ছিলেন ভূতাত্ত্বিক দলের প্রাণ পুরুষ বিপদময় পাহাড়ি ছড়া সুচ্চ গিরিপাড়াপার তিনি ছিলেন সকলের অগ্রণ চট্টগ্রামের পার্বত্য অঞ্চলে গহীন বনাঞ্চল বেষ্টিত পাহাড়ে ক্ষণে ক্ষণে বিপদের ইশারা তিনি কিন্তু অদ্ভুত ক্ষমতা ছিল তার পূর্ব আজ করার অস্ত্রধারী গোষ্ঠী বন্য হাতির মুখামুখি হয়েছে অনেকবার ভূতাত্ত্বিক দলগুলো 
তার প্রত্যুৎপন্ন মন্ডিতার ফলে ভূতাত্ত্বিক দলগুলো অনেক বাড়ি রক্ষা পেয়েছে আজকে যে বিষয়ে বক্তৃতা মালা হচ্ছে লেকচার হচ্ছে তার বিডাইট পার্বত্য চট্টগ্রামের বিভিন্ন সেকশন থেকে আবিষ্কারে তিনি ছিলেন সিদ্ধহস্ত ভূবিজ্ঞানের এই সৈনিকের প্রতি আমাদের সবার অভিবাদন তিনি চির জাগরুক হয়ে থাকুক আমাদের মাঝে আমরা তার বিদেহী আত্মার শান্তি কামনা করছি আমরা সকল সহমর্মী বৃন্দ তিরিশে অক্টোবর দু হাজার একুশ ধন্যবাদ আমরা এখন আমাদের মূল পর্বে সুইচ করব এবং আমাদের প্রথম যে প্রেজেন্টার যে তিনোট স্পিকার আছে ডক্টর আমিনুল ইসলাম আমি কিছুটা ওনার সম্পর্কে জানতে চাচ্ছি ডক্টর আমিনুল ইসলাম হি অবটেন্ড হিজ মাস্টার্স ফ্রম রাজশাহী ইউনিভার্সিটি জিওলজি অ্যান্ড মাইনিং ডিপার্টমেন্ট অ্যান্ড দেন হি গট হিজ দ্যাদার মাস্টার্স ফ্রম পেট্রোলিয়াম জিও সায়েন্স ইউনিভার্সিটি ইউনিভার্সিটি Uh, uh, science and technology he did his uh, postgraduate diploma in exploration geophysics from ITC Delft and later on he did his PhD in from University of Tsukuba in Japan he is currently chairing the department of geosciences at uh, University of uh, Brunei Darussalam earlier he was senior lecturer in at Malay Malay University in Malaysia Associate Professor, Department of Geology of Mining in Australian University, I told you before, and uh, he was for a brief period an employee of a geoscientist of Sikobangla as well. So I now invite uh, Dr. Ramin Islam to present his topic. Dr. Ramin Islam. Unmute, please. Good. Hmm. He's okay now. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, loud and clear. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah, sure. We can see it. Honorable session chair, Mr. Naj Hussain, dignified guest speaker, Professor M. Julia Jalalur Rahman, and moderator A. M. Manohar Ahmed, uh, who is a highly experienced ex-geologist of BAPEX and Kuwait Oil Company. We have got a legendary geologist, Dr. Jargan Leeds, who is an experienced and famous geologist. We have also got today many distinguished faculty and highly experienced professionals. We have also got many uh, MSc and PhD students, those who are now working with BAPEX and another company. Dear audience, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and very good evening. Welcome to Mir Moinul Haq Memorial Lecture 10. It is my immense pleasure and honor to be a keynote speaker of this session today. Before I proceed to my presentation, I would like to take the opportunity to show my profound respect to Mir Moinul Haq, a renowned petroleum geologist of Bangladesh, who has spent his whole life for the development and oil being of petroleum sector in Bangladesh. May Allah forgive him and grant him Jannatul Firdaus. I also take the privilege to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to the organizers of this memorial lecture series, especially Najim Bhai, Jasim Bhai, Monor Bhai, and Sisti Bhai.
So now I will talk about the first part of my presentation, turbidites, new exploration targets in Bengal Basin. Let us brush up our knowledge about turbidites. The term turbidite denote deep marine graded sandstone bed deposited by turbidity current. Here we can see a classic turbidite sequence. You can see the classic turbidite sequence. Proposed by Boma 1962. This is finding of sequence. So here you can see five divisions of turbidites, TA, TB, TC, TD, and T. This kind of Boma sequence need a complete one turbidity flask. We may not see complete Boma always, but there can be a partial Boma. Sometimes people mix up turbidite with other type of deep water sediments. Actually, turbidity current is a part of the whole flow dynamics. That's why a lot of controversy exists over 70 years. Here you can see some different opinion about turbidite sequence. You can see the Boma divisions here. You can see the Middleton and Hampton 1973. He divided uh, from TA to TD, one turbidity current, and then he said it is pelagic and uh, low turbidity current, low density turbidity current. And low 1982 divide also like high density current for TA and uh, rest of the three units, he said low density current. And now Shanmugam uh, also uh, you know, divide this turbidity sequence like lower one is uh, sandy debris flow, and other one is other two, three is like a bottom current reworking. And the top one is pelagic, hemiplasic. Now in the, on the lower, lower section, you can see the figure here. There's a current flow from right to left, you can see, and there's a sequence develop here. So you can see before the turbidites, the Boma sequence, TA to T, before that, we have six more units also, like R3, R1, R2, R3, S1, S2, S3. So this was proposed by Lowe. Lowe said that uh, before turbidite finding of sequence, there are some, uh, you know, uh, there are some high density turbidite. Uh, there are like uh, coarse grain sediments. So after turbidite boma, we can see some other reworked you know, evidence. So that is proposed by Shanmugam in uh, 1980. So this one is a genetic phases scheme by Walker. And you can see that uh, flow in initiation by a slump or slide and by river in flood. So the slump can be two types uh, fluid, fluid mechanism created. One is uh, fluid turbulence. Another is like a remolding liquefaction. So remolding uh, liquefaction can be turns to debris flow. And you can see debris flow can be a coarse grain sediment like this. And debris flow can turn back to low concentration turbidity current. And then it can go up to this final classical turbidites again. But the main mechanism of turbidites or uh, deep water stuffs come from actually uh, when rivers are in flood condition. So rivers are in flood condition, then they create a turbulence when they got a lot of sediments. And that turbulence can be a high concentration and concentration. High concentration will give rise to three different uh, pebble sandstone conglomerate and also partly massive sandstone. And low concentration will give rise to classical turbidites. Now you can see that classical turbidites actually the end product of a whole mechanism. So whenever we see uh, Boma sequence, that is a classical turbidites, but apart from Boma, we have also uh, different types of, uh, you know, coarse grain, uh, uh, you know, sandstone beds or conglomerate, something like this. So now you can see that conceptual model proposed by Shanmugam, and you can see here the process of turbidites. So we have slide, we have slump, 
we have debris flow, we have turbidity currents, and we have a, a canyon, and we can have other things also. So these are the procedure or process for creating turbidity current or turbidites. So you can see the deposits here on the other side. So when river is in flood condition, they carry a lot of sediments and they come to the shelters. And then due to the gravitational attraction, if, the, if due to the slope, they moves down and they create a canyon. And then they moves down to the, you know, until offshore. And you can see different types of deposits, channel deposits, levy deposits, also lobe deposits. Also there are slum, we can see some other deposits also. And we can see turbidite deposits, even close to the slope area, even distal part, we can see turbidites. That means turbidite can develop maybe different parts, even slope, even close to the slope, even distal part, we can find turbidites. So now uh, we come back uh, to our, uh, we come back to our Bangladesh turbidites because uh, for, for, from this from this presentation, we want to propose a new target of exploration. So in this case, uh, probably we will propose turbidites that before going to turbidites, let's uh, make an inventory of our exploration activities in Bangladesh. So over the last hundred years, we have deal like more than 200 wells. Within 200 wells, uh, there are 77 exploration wells and we have got like 28 discoveries. And we have currently a production well like 100, 113, and we have got 28 gas fields. But considering the tightness of the structure, tight fold discovery 12 field, and gentle fold discovery 14 fields, combination trap one, study graphic trap one, and we have like uh, five dry holes in shelf area. Shelf area, we have no discovery above the shelf edge. And if we consider about the tectonic divisions, 4 deep, Bengal 4 deep got 16 field, and Surma Basin alone got 11 fields, and Fold Belt got one field. So far, no official discovery in deep water turbidite yet. So within this discovery time or exploration time, our total recoverable reserve is 2040 CF but we consume most of the gases now remaining only 5 TCF. So the country is in severe crisis of energy right now. Government is trying to get an alternative you know, supplement like nuclear or like LNG, other things. But, but gas resource is the most viable and effective and uh, cost-effective uh, resource for us. So we have to expedite our exploration and we have to increase our reserve. So that's how uh, that exploration business is now really vital for us. Let's uh, see the neighboring country, West Bengal. And they have got one discovery like uh, Chubbish Parguna, they have got a discovery of oil. So over the 60 years, they have drilled 150 wells uh, in West Bengal, but they have got official discovery in only one. Can you imagine? And they have spent like last two years for the field development purpose, they spend uh, 3,400 crores of Indian rupee. And they have another uh, policy to develop another three wells uh, by next year. And you can see that 100 wells give them one discovery and we have 77 wells give us 28 discoveries. Even some part of the world, even a single field, they drill thousands of wells. In this case, our case, only all together 200. That means we are really, really underdeveloped or underexplored. That means we have still potential. We have to look for it and we have to give a drive. So let's move on to the next slide. You can see the greater aspect of Bengal Basin. Here is Bangladesh Bengal Basin. On the west part of Bay of Bengal, you can see there is a basin, Indian basin called Krishna Gudavari Basin and Mahanodi Basin. And on the other side, there's a Rakhine Basin. So Indian part, they already discovered 40, 40 CF gas. 
from deep water turbidites. And Rakhine part, they already discovered around 13 to 14 TCF, and the total discovery within their offshore area like 20 TCF. What about us? We have only one field, Sangu field. Now production probably stopped. And Kutubdia is not producing. So that is our exploration actually. And we have few blocks very close to Rakhine Basin. So I'll talk about that. So let's see our block area. You can see that Rakhine Basin with a red bubble here. On the right side, you can see. And our blocks, SS11, our block DS12, SS10, all just nearby Rakhine Basin and their, their discovery, three fields, okay? And uh, if we talk about the reserve of this three field, Shui field got like 4.67 TCF. Shui few got like around one TCF. Maya field got more than two TCF. But altogether, reserve can go up to seven or eight TCF. But there is a new st uh, statement again that only shoe field can get a nine TCF gas. So altogether, it gone up to the Myanmar offshore reserve gone up to 20 TCF. Look at this, their discovery history. But they are our neighbor, they are just next door. So now come back to the shoe field. You can see that amplitude maps on the right side corner, top right corner, and three fields are aligned in the strike direction. And there is a, another section, deep direction. So look at this strike section just below the shelf as within 40 kilometers, there are three giant gas fields you can see here. And the fields are gentle, folded. Inside the field, there are some deep water stuffs. I'll discuss now. So look at this beautiful slide here. And I will discuss one by one that they have got like submarine canyon and the evidence submarine canyon is very clear here with the sashmi. And they have like interpreted in, within this, you know, submarine canyon, there are some bright amplitude anomaly there. And we, they have also confined slope channel complex system. You see the stack and inside seismic, it's a clear channel there and there are some light amplitude there. You don't need to be a very good interpreter. The seismic will tell you things that there is something inside. And then they have an aggregational channel levy complex. So the channels are aggregational and they have a levy complex also. And from seismic is very clear. They have an isolated channel. You can see the channel here. And you can see the log, the blocky nature of the log indicates a channel. And they have a frontal spray that they have a loaf. The loaves are switching left, right. It's like a fluvial fan. So you can see the blocky nature of the seismic also indicates that. And also they have like a mass transport complex. All the evidence are turbidites and they are just next door, our maritime boundary. Here you can look at the picture on the left side. They have a, a isopack map, a thickness map, and there's a boundary here. You can see in the right, right part of the emails. Uh, this is bottom of the channel. Inside the channel also the signature of some sand deposits with a bright amplitude here. And the channels are very clear. Inside the channel, it's not that all channels are opaque or cavity, but there are some amplitudes. So, the channel is very clear in the uh, isopet map. It's a clear channel is flowing from north to south. You can see very clear. And they have also like a semblance map. The channels in the semblance map is very clear. They have taken like three cross section and you can see the very nice, very nice, uh, you know, uh, amplitude anomaly inside the channel also here also here. So there are a lot of evidence of like a confined channel channel complex system here. So they have also aggregational channel levy complex. So it's very clear. 
So this is a cartoon, but interpretations, and this is a seismic image. You can see here. Now from Rakhine Basin, we come back to our Bangladesh part, and this data comes from Bibiana field, though it was a confidential field right now, but recently uh, there is a publication already published in AAPG. So I got the information from AAPG, and this is uh, uh, like a reference here. You can see here the reference. So this is a seismic. Normally, uh, Bibiana is a very uh, tight anticline, and you can see that here is the seismics are all flat. So they flatten the horizon. There is a technique that they flat the horizon to better visualize uh, the stratigraphic uh, you know, elements. So you can see that SB80 is a sequence boundary here. And below SB80, there are high amplitudes, sand uh, horizons are there. And the channels, they cut the you know, reservoir sand. Surprisingly, the sand body is producing. That means the channels are, you know, the canyons are, you know, shell dominating and they are uh, creating a lateral uh, seal barrier. So the, sometimes it seems that they are shell plugged, but they are also working positively to restore or uh, stop the lateral migration and to help the accumulate oil and gas inside the reservoir. So this kind of, you know, uh, you know, deep water stuff is not only that they always uh, be a house of oil and gas, not like that. They can be a lateral barrier, then they can help us to, you know, storm migration and to accumulate oil and gas. So there is another picture here. I intentionally placed this picture here, a uh, seismic section here. You can see that uh, Rashidpur is here. You can see Bibiana gas field here. And there is another anticline here. And you can see the interpretations all the way that uh, they have the similar evidence of Bhuvan and Bukabil with the same structure. And uh, I don't know that uh, whether, uh, uh, whether uh, the people, uh, those who are in the management of Petrobangla or Bapex, they are aware of this structure or not. But uh, this is an area that we can concentrate we think that always that uh, our easy stops or uh, all the structural traps are all uh, being drilled already, but I can see the very nice structure. So maybe Petrobang or Bapex can reinterpret or acquire new seismic and delineate the prospect and they can immediately go for drilling. I think this, everything is there. Only thing that whether it, it has got poor way deep closer or not, or all the uh, petroleum system elements are available so that nearby they have all the pressure regime. They know the petroleum system. They know the, all the reservoirs. They can have a good correlations. So they can easily find out this target. So this is beyond our scope of this presentation, but I am really interested to see this structure. Probably uh, BAPEX or Petrobangla people can think about it. So here you can see that uh, there's a core evidence from Bibiana field, and you can see that is, they call sequence boundary 60, and sequence boundary 60 here, above the sequence boundary, there is amalgamated or conglomeratic mudstone uh, that followed by some, you know, uh, blocky sands. Uh, this is like a deep water turbidites sequence that evidence is there, and the log pattern also indicates, and you can see that from course to finding, so there is a, you know, turbiditic uh, signature here. Now look at this picture here, fantastic picture. And you can see that uh, all the paleo channels are really, really uh, visualized. And you can see the flow direction uh, from north to south is like a braided channel. So that means a lot of channel or paleo channel or paleo canal, uh, canyon is available uh, in uh, Viviana field. So it's not that Viviana is an isolated case. So Viviana is a part of the whole basin. So if something uh, inside the Viviana, probably further down to Viviana or further left, right, the similar events are available. So now they have proposed a, a model here. You can see the model got a lot of stuff like uh, Delta front sediment, shell paste. So all the elements from Delta plane, 
they have like a tidal flat, they have like a tidal bar, sandy bar, and they have an outer shelf, everything is there, but they have also a model that uh, from, from Delta plane to now offshore shelf is until this place, uh, they are expecting, you know, deep water stuffs, there is a channels. Uh, so who knows that deep water stuffs, uh, not only their uh, clay flat, they can have reservoir scale, turbidite sandstone, okay. So we have to look for it. So now come back to our uh, Shangu field. This is a picture from Shangu or seismic section from Shangu. So you can see uh, this is a reservoir scale. Uh, this is a mega sequence one. Uh, so this uh, image uh, I took from Naziman Atal and uh, 2011 is published. So you can see our Fanny at both cases, you can see a lot of uh, channels here, a lot of channels here, a lot of channels there. So we have a lot of uh, evidence of uh, channel field deposits. And now we have to look for whether it is clay plug or there is a sand or high amplitude anomaly is there or not. But if clay plug, they can help us to create a stratigraphic barrier. So here again from Shangu field, you can see uh, the lot of uh, nice uh, uh, amplitude anomaly at this level. But on top of that, uh, there are some chaotic events within the channel. Uh, probably these are all shell, but inside the channel, there are some bright amplitude. But we have to make a proper, uh, proper uh, event chart so that we can realize that uh, whether there's a charge inside or oil and gas migrated here or not. So these things, uh, maybe proper delineation is possible then we can find out that probably there are some turbidites within the channel, or if not, there is no turbidite. Again, I mentioned that it can be a lateral barrier for existing reservoirs. So this, I again come back uh, to Krishna Godavari Basin, and you can see this nice attribute anomalies. Uh, this is a uh, RMS amplitude map, and you can see you don't need to be interpreter here. You can see the paleo channels very clear. So uh, this comes from Indian part of Bay of Bengal. And uh, you can see the, all the drilling points here. And they have like a river mouth. This is a river mouth from uh, Godavari and Krishna rivers. And then we have also Ganges Brahmaputra. There is a river mouth also from Mahanadi, also from uh, Kaveri. So all this place uh, got some signature of deep water turbidites, but why not Bengal Basin? So now come back to Rakhine again. You can see the Rakhine, uh, high amplitude anomaly is three fields, consecutive three fields like Shui field, Shui few and Maya, Maya field. And then you see the paleo direction and they interpreted that this uh, sediments are maximum coming from Ganges Brahmaputra. And now come back to this map here. You see that red bubble here and go on top of that, that our SS-11 and this uh, production sharing field probably owned by Chris Energy or some other people. But this uh, uh, image or this uh, you know, figure comes from one of their presentation at CPEX. So you can see their attribute map here. Very nice attributes just right above this three discovery. And you can see that uh, we have uh, uh, five, six uh, like uh, prospect they identify. So it is not being drilled yet. So you can see the maps on the right side. So there are few prospect there. So right before these uh, three discoveries. So there's a huge potential that similar type of environment or deposition or deep water stuff could be there. So now we wrap up our Bangladesh part. So we have all the evidences of deep water turbidites, uh, prospect and discoveries within the vicinity of Bay of Bengal. So recent discoveries in West Bengal, huge discoveries in Krishna Gudavari Basin, approximate 40, 40 CF gas, Mahanadi Basin adjacent to Bay of Bengal is really eye-opening for us. 
So one of the world's top 10 deep water gas fields called Dhirubhai is located at, you know, Krishna Gudavari Basin. You will be surprised 60 square kilometer field, 125 meter net fay. So who knows if we are lucky, if we have a desperate uh, activities, we can have like that. So most encouraging example of deep water turbidites are located at Shui field, Shui few and Maya fields at Rakhine Basin. These discoveries are right on the southeastern border of Bangladesh Myanmar maritime boundary. And Myanmar got total offshore reserve until now 20 TCF. So considering all the evidence, if we want to offset the future gas crisis of Bangladesh, we should declare the deep water turbidites as our new exploration frontier. So after the conclusive remarks, I have some recommendations. We should acquire new data and reinterpret existing seismic to figure out the feasibility of drilling the anticlinal structure between Satok and Chanolabad, as I mentioned in my earlier slide. And we should drill immediate vicinity of Rakhine Basin. For example, block SS10, block SS11, and DS12. These three blocks are just right before the you know, Rakhine discoveries. We also need to strengthen our exploration activities from Rakhine Basin to Surma Basin to look for deep water targets. So from all the way from Rakhine to Surma, because Surma Basin also got evidence, in between there are some evidence. So we have to look for turbidites. And then for that, for, that, for that purpose, we have to do some, or we have to acquire some high quality seismic to get a better clue. And later on, we can search for stratigraphic taps as well, below the shelf as up to Kustia, Jashur, Shatkira, Kulna, bordering Chobish Porgon of West Bengal. So if the drill, more than 160, why not we drill try for few of them? So that is my recommendation about Bangladesh. Now come back to my second part of the presentation. The title of the presentation is 3D modeling of turbidites, a case study from New Zealand. Actually, this is a part of the PhD project of my PhD student, Surya Tezas Vithota. For time constraint, I am not going to discuss detail of the modeling. This is study currently under consideration for publication. For some reason, I am not disclosing the name of the field and study. The study field is located at Taranaki Basin, New Zealand, and this is an onshore field having Myosin Reservoir. Data for this study was given by New Zealand Ministry of Petroleum. You can see that location of the field here. This is New Zealand, and this is whole Taranaki Basin, and this is our study field. And this is the seismic block. And this is, you can see the location of different wells. And study graphically, uh, you see that the top Myosin Reservoir is uh, our target. So now we talk about the flow chart of my of our modeling. So as usual, we convert our you know well coordinate uh, to seismic coordinate because most of the cases well coordinate and seismic coordinate is different. So we convert uh, the well coordinate to seismic coordinate. Then we load the data in the workstation or in our case spectral software. And then we do seismic to well tie. And then we do for go for horizon, horizon picking. And then we go for interpretation of false and horizon together. Okay. So now it's a routine, routine matter for uh, those who are interpreter. So then we create a time structure or depth structure, depth structure map. Then we do velocity modeling. Velocity modeling help us to convert time to depth. And then we create a structure fault framework model. 
Then we go for corner for point modeling. We go for make horizon zone layering. And then we finally construct 3D structural model. After 3D structural model, we go for phases modeling. We upscale the log and phases modeling is a tricky part. So we have information from well log, we have information from core photographs, we have uh, cuttings from the mud log, and we have also uh, like a, a well completion report. All together, we try to find out the phases, and then we do the modeling, and then we go for petrophysical modeling. So we calculate petrophysical parameters using some other softwares, and then we transfer that data inside the petri. So both phases modeling and petrophysical modeling, we go for property modeling. Then we mass structural modeling and property modeling together. We got a complete reservoir model, and then we characterize the reservoir. So what do we characterize? Because in our case, we are not going to actually uh, really prove it that it is a, it is a turbidite. But it is a proven basin and it is a proven formation and it is a proven field, it's, pro it's producing. In this case, then what is our job? So we have a comprehensive plan, but it is a part of the PhD project that we have to go for modeling. What modeling, modeling will give us? The modeling can give us whether is there any compartment or is there any undrained area? Is there any possibility for infill drilling? Is there any possibility of further development well? Is there any possibility of reserve growth? Is there any possibility for three-dimensionally we can look for any heterogeneity? Is there any possibility for uh, minimizing the further risk of uh, dealing uh, development well so that we can build up the confidence, we can build up uh, uh, the, you know, what do you call it, uh, uh, technical uh, you know, robustness, and then we can minimize the risk and we can you know, uh, safeguard our revenue. So here you can see the depth structure map and depth structure map gives us a clue about the uh, crystal part of the structure. And you can see the north, northwest and southeast part is a deeper uh, sloping area and the central and then northeastern part is a shallowest part and all the well locations are on the structure, uh, shallowest part. And we have a thickness map, we call isocore map. This is a vertical thickness. So thickness will give you a clue about the reservoir. Where is the good reservoir? Where the you know uh, little less quality reservoir means in terms of thickness. Because when you do when you do uh, reserve reserve estimation, thickness is a vital criteria. So we need thickness. We need aerial distribution. We need net to gross. We need uh, saturation. We need porosity, and while doing a resource uh, computation or quantification, uh, we need thickness. So thickness is a important criteria that which direction the sediment is thicker or thinner. So this is an attribute map. We have generated many attributes, but this is one of them, RMS amplitude attribute map. So you can see that uh, bright amplitude indicate some indication of hydrocarbons and some drilling points are really coincide with that attributes. And you can see that fault sticks here, they compartmentalize the uh, reservoir and still some compartment is undrained and there are some amplitudes. So we can, we can have a new development well uh, where there is a uh, you know, undrained area. So here you can see 3D view of the fault surface of the study area and you can see that uh, the fault alignment, and uh, we have altogether 11 fault, fault alignment, uh, length of the fault, and uh, what do you call, uh, their orientation is very important because if they segmented your reservoir, so their influence within the, you know, uh, what do you call it, within the reservoir is very, you know, influential. So we have to know that. So here is a 3D model of a structural model and you can see very nicely it's a four-way deep closure. And you can see that how faults are propagated through the field and how wells are penetrated. So now you can easily find out where you can have your 
another development well or something like this. Now we can come back to uh, see some core photographs. You can see that crescent shape log motif can give us a clue about the slope fan. And you can see inside that core, we have sandstone, we have siltstone, some evidence are there. So now you can see here some massive sandstone. We can have some turbidite, uh, some component like uh, TB, TC, and some other component like TB or TD, something like this. So all the ripple laminated sandstone and the horizontal lamination and climbing ripple, and we have a horizontal laminated sandstone, all the evidence are components of turbidites. So here you can see that rocky nature indicates uh, a basin floor fan and the sands are very clean, you can see, and we have some turbidite components are available here. So now we divide the logs uh, in a two different uh, regime. You can see that uh, a low gamma on, the, on top is high gamma. So there's a clear distinction, uh, basin floor fan and also a slope fan. And you can see the two different regime and the, the lower one get a better reservoir and you can see some thin bed sand also, some other uh, blocky nature sand, you can see. So comparatively, uh, the sands are better quality than uh, the upper, uh, you know, upper slope fan. So because of the, you can, by looking at the log, you can have an idea like this. So you can see that, uh, we also calculate uh, different petrophysical properties. So log signature along with uh, petrophysical properties for slope fan and also we have basin floor fan. And you can see the difference of petrophysics not that much big, but still uh, basin floor fan got a better quality and higher uh, permeabilities, porosity and hydrocarbon saturation. You can see that cross section through the uh, you know faces model. This is a map view of a faces model, and you can see the cross sectional view and a very nicely how sand and silt or clay how they propagate vertically or laterally, so that you can have a better picture. And then you can see very nice area of sand, and you can make your plan that how you can drill where you can go for a next you know development well. Now we can have a 3D view of a faces model. And this is a, a top view. So you can have a cross section in any direction. You can make a fence, fence diagram. Also porosity you can see here. So what is the high porous area? You can easily find out and you can see the drilling locations already drilled. So where is the other drilling locations? You can find out. So by looking at faces, faces means sand is our target. Porosity means high porous area. And then we have like water and hydrocarbon saturation. And you can see a very fantastic hydrocarbon saturation model, very high saturation of hydrocarbon. Uh, on the other hand, we have a very low water saturation here on the left side. So it's quite, so they are like vice versa. So high hydrocarbon means low water is very nice correlations. So you can now find out that where is the highest hydrocarbon saturation. And you can make a cross section also, and you can make any direction to see the uh, hydrocarbon saturation. And now we have a permeability. Permeability is another thing that we have no uh, scope right now to calculate from the logs, but we have got some core data, and then we uh, plot the depth versus permeability, and then we digitize it and make a last file and transfer it to Petrel, and then we propel through the you know, model, and then we got a permeability model. But volume of shell, volume of shell can give you some sort of heterogeneity, and uh, if the reservoir is uh, in, in homogeneous or not, something like this. And now come back to netto gross. So netto gross is a, uh, is a, a part of your uh, resource uh, reserve calculations. So we need area, we need thickness, we need net to gross, we need saturation, we need uh, porosity. For net to gross calculation, we use three different types of uh, you know, cutoff. So for 
uh, porosity, we take like uh, anything below 10%, we cut. And for water saturation, anything above 50%, we cut. And for shell volume, anything above uh, 50%, we cut. So after cutting all these things, this is a net model. So we got it. So now we got a cross section of all the properties. Now you can make your plan if you want to deal something. So whether your deal can be a vertical well or it can be a divided well, or you can go laterally if the if you want to go uh, like horizontal drilling, few kilometer is possible by looking at this. So this is one cross section, but you can have a multiple cross section and you can make a fence diagram and you can have a better picture of the reservoir. So that's the end of the uh, modeling part. And we have, uh, we, I have to wrap up now. So the conclusion is basin floor fan is considered to be better reservoir than the slope fan. And all the models give ample opportunity to find the reservoir potential from 3D perspective. And these models certainly will help to locate further development or infill drilling and resource quantifications. So the proposed model and this workflow easily can be used for similar deep water turbidites modeling elsewhere in the world. So it can be even used for Bengal Basin also. It's not that it is limited to turbidites. It can be any other part. It can be a, you know, a shore face. It can be tidal. It can be other fluvial or any other places. We can, we can use this kind of modeling. So fields, if the field is a mature field, but still you have a plan to go for 10, 12, 20 uh, development wells. So if you make a model, so then you can minimize your cost of, uh, you know, dry, for dry hole of development wells. So there are dry holes even development wells. So you can quantify the resource very nicely and you can have a reserve growth also. So all these things is a boost up for, uh, uh, for the existing field also. So that's the end of the presentation. And thank you very much. Now the floor is open for question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Ramin uh, We'll take questions from uh, to the chat box only because uh, Dr. Ramin Islam is from Brunei Dal Salaam. I think it's so coming close to midnight there. So uh, I request our audience to uh, just uh, their questions in chat boxes. Okay. May, may, I ask, may I ask some questions to Ramin Islam? I am Professor Julia Jalal Roman. Sure. Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, the turbidites mm -hmm. you deal in New Zealand case, the, is it a classical turbidites or, uh, or is a massive uh, sandstone turbidites? Uh, it's, a, it's a massive sandstone turbidites, but partly massive and partly you know, slope is not massive. But, but below you that, know, it's a, it's but you know. It's a 600 meter thick. But, but you know, uh, the massive sandstone, uh, um, the cold grain sandstone with graded, with graded bedding, uh, there are some uh, puzzles uh, exist in the world nowadays. Uh, so similar type of sandstone exhibit their short deposition, not deep water turbidites. Mm. So, uh, but sandstone in place in the, uh, in the muddy bodies, this is deep water sandstone, but Sometimes massive graded sandstone may not uh, represent deep water turbidity. It may represent uh, shell water deposition, surface deposition. What is your okay. opinion? Okay. For your you, information. In your model, in your model, uh, did you take any examples of microfossils or uh, microfossils that you point to some indication of marine environment? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and. Uh, it's a very good question, actually. Uh, so uh, it's not that always thick, massive sandstone can be, you know, turbidized. Uh, but you know, if there is a pelagic event uh, on top of the turbidized, and they got some fossil, and uh, uh, we are not studying fossil, but uh, it is there are some literature and they have got evidences of uh, uh, offshore fossil. Because uh, TB, T, TB, TC, these beds, uh, uh, these deposits uh, 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 under traction current. So similar type of uh, sedimentary bodies uh, can form in other environment also. So 
so it uh, so it can be juxtaposed in other environments so it's very difficult sometimes okay i understand but problem is the core i show you is not the whole core but partly there is a other component within the you know turbidite sequence uh, probably that is not core so we have no evidence right now but there are literature proof literature and people and a company you know book or some other publications they have evidences but our job is not to prove it that whether it is turbidite we consider that it is a turbidite and we are just focusing on the modeling the turbidites that is our okay. uh, uh, for promising uh, explosion target uh, you should have uh, better knowledge on um, petrography uh, for ensuring a better quality reservoir uh, um, in turbidites so did you uh, try uh, to uh, make analysis on uh, on model composition of turbidites over there so we have we have some data that is we got the data from new zealand we have core data but core data is only few uh, you know some petrography is there of course the petrography is there but it's not the whole section it's a 600 meter it's not the whole core we got so we have some information there for example reservoir quality or other things like petrography we have the evidences but for some uh, reason i am i am not showing you all the evidences here uh, may I, may I show you show you some, some, some my slides two slides that uh, i made doctor uh, we we'll come to your after the one give us some uh, some time may and uh, i i will I? tell you when to start just before you you contribute could i ask one of the students of uh, the prime minister to say something janet roy or someone else of, of their work on their work hello i think uh, doctor yeah. amun islam uh, i got up there hello janet or Janet, you asked me a question. No, I'm I'm requesting them to say something about the work and uh, what we come. Okay, can I can I go to the chat box and see one by one? Sure, but before that, let me let me conclude with Dr. Dilalal's presentation, and then we'll go to the chat box. Okay, actually, actually yes. this is not my presentation. I will just uh, show you uh, some of my. Uh, so that's two slides uh, uh, that will show the some of the occurrence of, of, uh, of turbidites in Bengal Basin in onshore part and in offshore part. Uh, that's all. Actually, I did not work on uh, turbidites. Basically, uh, I did with uh, sediment geochemistry and diagenesis, reservoir quality, like so on. So actually, uh, I did a detailed work on turbidites. But I, I have I have got informed of some of the occurrence of turbidites in and in onshore Bengal Basin and offshore Bengal. That I share with you. Might be. Yeah, doctor, uh, let, let, uh, let, let me introduce you. Very out of this. I just, uh, just, just two slides that support. Uh, let me introduce you to the audience. Uh, our guest speaker is Dr. Gilizalal Rahman. He is uh, currently the chair, uh, professor of uh, geosciences in uh, Jahangir University at Jahangir University. And uh, Dr. Rahman degree, uh, he achieved his uh, PhD from Vienna, Austria in 1999. And uh, he was a fellow of Okayama University, Japan, University of Bonn, University of Liverpool, UK, and uh, many other fellowships. So I would request uh, Dr. Dilejanal Rahman to present his uh, case and uh, his, uh, his view. Please go ahead. Dr. Zillah Dalal Rahman. Dr. Zillah Rahman. We lost the link or not? Disconnected. Disconnected. Okay. Um, in that case, let me ask one of the students of Dr. Ramil Islam 
to introduce so, them sir and uh, can i can i answer something i have got a question from mohidul islam gm lab uh, to everyone but uh, uh, he uh, asked a question that i have one question regarding the porosity if the turbidite sequence is greater depth is it sustain the required porosity so it's a geological simple concept that the more you go deeper and your uh, porosity will uh, go down uh, but if there is a secondary development yeah porosity can be stored but in that case you have to uh, go for a study the you know, petrography and you have to look for whether is there any really signature of uh, secondary porosity development if secondary porosity not developed of course due to depth the porosity will reduce because of the compaction but if secondary porosity uh, supplement our primary you know reduction then there will be a restoration of porosity so is that the answer mr rohidu Could you um, unmute uh, admin, Mr. Wahidu? Uh, can I answer one more question? Go ahead. Moinul Hasan, Moinul Hasan from Bapex. Hello. Can you hear me? Sure, go ahead. Can you Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Yeah. So Moinul asked me that why all IOCs relinquishing offshore PSC is it geological or economical? Very interesting question. I like it because uh, this is for everyone, but I am answering also because I am responding. So it's surprising that uh, our IOCs are relinquishing offshore PSC. So to me. Uh, the U company, international company, uh, quit. Just they have got discovery, but they are really uh, quitting from our block. Probably it is political. So far, I understand. And uh, of course, uh, there are some issues uh, that, uh, of course, it is not geological. It is rather other side. Like it can be a pricing of gas or anything. Or dealing of uh, you know if they have a discovery then how they will sell it and whether they will have a profit margin or not or uh, if uh, something like that or they have a different strategy like okay they have a, a neighboring country they have a block from probably the neighboring country wants them not to develop any field in Bangladesh site so that is my uh, you know understanding. Aziz, Janet, Evang, Surya, So, Surya, can you unmute? Janet, can you unmute? Julie, there is a computer problem. So, can I can I ask one question from Dr. Ajat? Can I answer sure, one question? Sure, sure, sure. go ahead. Uh, he, he said some of the complexities of turbidite also needed to be considered. Compactional dikes and compartmentalization of the reservoir that need to be considered. Yes, if, uh, if there is a compactional dikes or anything like that, I agree with you, no problem. If there is a compartment, we have to take note of that. So as you are already working on that side, uh, probably you know very well. Thank you very much. Is there any more question for you, Doctor? If there is, please go ahead. Please Hello? Yes, sir. Hello? Sure. Please, can you... Good evening, Doctor. I'm, I'm Janet. 
Uh, earlier, we were not able to unmute ourselves. We were giving the access just now. And uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful presentation and the slides are very detailed. I don't have any questions from my end, Doctor. Thank you so much. Can you open your video camera? <laughs> Janet, can you open the video? Yeah, sure, Doctor. Just give me a second. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. So what do you have in, for future? What, why, why do you want to take your work from here? Um, petroleum. I'm actually a first semester student. I just recently joined. My background is from mechanical engineering, but I want to pursue a career in geology. So I'm under Dr. Amino. I'm, I'm a new student. I'm a new student oh, in okay. UBD right now. So that's all. can you introduce your a doctoral student to be this work with you. I'm I'm sorry, doctor. No, I'm talking about talking to Dr. Amin Mahak. It's fun. All right. We introduce the other uh, student and good, good luck to you. Okay, uh, Surya. Surya, are you here? Yes, sir. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, sir. Uh, hello, all respected doctors and professors. Uh, I'm yes. Surya. We cannot um, see you. Uh, sorry, sir. My desktop doesn't have a camera facility. I'm really sorry oh. for that. Okay. You do okay. yourself. Uh, and uh, I'm Surya. I'm from India. I'm working under uh, Aminul, sir. I'm doing PhD uh, in Geo uh, Geosciences Department. So I guess that you are doing the work on modeling, right? Surya, can you explain about your background? Uh, yes, sir. Sure, sir. Uh, I did my bachelor's in uh, chemical engineering. Uh, and after that, I did my master's in petroleum engineering. Uh, in between, I worked a couple of years. After my, my bachelor's, I worked in a petro, uh, pharma industry. And after that, again, uh, I pursued my master's in uh, petroleum engineering. And uh, after that, I worked in a food processing company as a quality control. And now I got opportunity to... Uh, do my P two PhD in a uh, university Brunei Darussalam under Amnul sir. Thank you for introducing yourself. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amin Islam, for your uh, good presentation. The theoretical part and the uh, <coughs> presentation on your work from New Zealand. I think all the is Janet the matter is that we need to have good core data. Is Janet yeah, has any topic. question? Janet has any question to his her professor? No, doctor. I don't have any questions. The presentation was very clear. Good. Thank you. So I would like to make two comments. And uh, this uh, the modeling part of uh, property, especially the property mod modeling, we need good core data in. Uh, I worked with Buffett for a couple of years, and during that time, I realized that we need a lot of code data required. But mainly due to easy discoveries in the 60s and 70s, we had a mindset or kind of anchored mind that we need few codes from the reservoir only. But now we think that uh, coding is required for entire section, entire maybe sequence or mega sequence to have a proper robust modeling. And that's the key. And uh, as we know from this data, that we have uh, sequence there. This needs to be extended and uh, needs to be propagated in the, in the areas where we have seismic data. And if uh, that is done, we can progress very quickly, I hope. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Bill Dalal, if you are still there, or to make a presentation of your, your uh, comments, please. Or else I will like, I request Dr. Lee to have some insight on what the presentation was about. Dr. Lee, are you there? Dr. Lee and Dr. Zulla Zalal having computer problem. 
Julie said he is getting very weak Wi-Fi signals. He can hear us, but he cannot show his face and sound. So now we can go to general questions. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am MD Mijara Rahman, MD Slate Guest Field. Mm, thanks. Uh, I want to convey thanks to Mr. Amin Islam. It's a very nice presentation. Uh, actually, uh, from the inception, I missed some anyway, but uh, uh, the presentation is very much uh, contributable and particularly how to explore in Bangladesh. And you have shown a structure in Roshitpur. So uh, you will be happy that we are going to drill in Roshitpur as a deep well. So uh, I think my one question already, Mr. Ahidul Islam, he asked you about the porosity development in the deeper, deeper prospect. So actually, uh, now we are planning to drill below 4,500 meters. So that's why we are thinking the reservoir rock having good porosity or not. So, and also we have to cause the over pressure, high pressure. And we have to consider the temperature gradient. Even in some structure, we are thinking to drill uh, about 6,000 meters. And particularly in uh, Mubarpur, about 5,000. So we are happy that at present uh, in Bangladesh, uh, we all are thinking to drill deeper. So uh, it's a very good presentation, but I have a small question, maybe uh, just not question, it's a discussion about the reserve estimation you told, uh, net, net to gross component. So actually, uh, conventionally, when I'm making a reserve estimation, so if I calculate the shell volume, then I think gross, net gross ratio is not required. Am I right? Net in a sense that when you exclude shell, that means you exclude non-reservoir part. But inside the reservoir also, it's not that all reservoir are producible reservoir. In that case, you have to apply cutoff for porosity and apply cutoff for saturation. If the low saturation zone, you have to omit. And you have to low porosity zone, you have to exclude also to get a better part of the reservoir. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have got a question from Abdul Malik, my, uh, my student from Russia University. He's an associate, assistant professor right now. Uh, he asked me a question that why uh, BAPEX uh, got a lot of uh, success? Why BAPEX still cannot uh, drill that much? What is the problem? So being a general manager of BAPEX last time, can you answer this question? Even moderator can ask the answer that question. <laughs> okay, okay. The, uh, see the problem in Bangladesh is uh, the methodology about the way that budgeting is work, the way that you acquire the, your services, uh, your uh, uh, appropriation of the uh, the fund that you are given with, and also the the very drilling business is quite the exploration and the drilling business is quite uh, we can say it's kind of a very narrow window. Like you need to have a proper time planning. You need to have the proper fund and the very robust system of acquiring the services. This is not present and with the current government ruling rule that uh, in, in place, it's very difficult to acquire services or start a drilling project or get quick uh, results, which is very much easy for compared to the IOCs or uh, other companies. So this is the primary reason, the funding, the process of acquiring the fund, the process of getting approvals for drilling or uh, any exploration activity, and the freedom for the geoscientists to work and uh, you know get their uh, their, their uh, foresight or their way of working 
it's very difficult in this current setup of the government rules and regulations. That's why I think the, the main reason. Dr. Dr. Jalal is live now, so Munwa, you can start with him. Yes, Dr. Jalal, Jalal your comments, please. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am Professor Jula Jala Rahman, working at the Department of Geological Sciences, Jangin University. So it's my pleasure to be here as a part of Ms. Moyer Ross Minimal Lecture 10. Uh, so actually, uh, Najib has asked me to do, uh, to do something on turbidites. Uh, basically, I did not work on turbidites. Uh, I am uh, working on sediment geochemistry and diagenesis, reserve diagenesis and so on. But anyway, I just share you with some slides uh, of the occurrence of turbidite in the Bengal Basin. My, my, that might be uh, definitely you are aware of this. Uh, in spite of that, uh, Okay. Uh, Aziz, you can also do the slide sharing. Some check. Yes, Julie, you can see in the screen. Okay, can I see the slides? Yes. Yes. I just showed just two slides uh, um, as the, the turbidites occurrence in the onshore Bengal basin, um, uh, uh, particularly in the southeastern part of the Bengal uh, basin uh, that is folded uh, part, um, particularly in the uh, Shitabhar, Anticline, and Bandhavan, Ragamati, as well as in Shitagund also. There are some limit, uh, limited occurrence of uh, turbidites, uh, very thin turbidites uh, with some uh, slump and uh, debris flow deposits, uh, but these are in place within thicker interval of mudstone. Uh, particularly, this is observed in the lower Shuma group, uh, but more thicker turbidites noted in Mirinja anticline lama. This is onshore uh, turbidites. Uh, and this is another example. The turbidites in uh, offshore gas field, that is Shango gas field that I uh, uh, was talking about. This is uh, earlier slide. This is deep water turbidites, or uh, all, almost uh, for three or four Boma divisions of the air, TA, TBTC, and so on. Uh, not complete one. Though Professor Uma and Akta told uh, that he got full uh, division of turbidites in Shidavar anticline, uh, but I did not observe that. Um, the, another one is uh, a massive sandstone that Amir was talking about. This massive sandstone actually uh, observed in a uh, depth of uh, 3,150 meter to 3,154 meter in Tango Tizet well. Actually, there is here is controversy. This is they, they, uh, this is from uh, metallic uh, from marine metallic uh, from Can Energy. They actually to, uh, wanted to say that this is not classical or marine turbidites. This is uh, uh, this turbidites is is, uh, is uh, spread across the self area. The, uh, this is shallow water turbidites. Uh, uh, when sed uh, these sediments were actually discharged from high, uh, discharged from uh, Pelu, Brahmaputra, uh, Pelu, Ganges, uh, like Pelu Channel area. During high discharge, uh, during high the peak discharge, uh, triggered by monsoon time, when massive volumes of uh, this uh, suspended sediment can evolve into uh, concentrated sediment flows uh, that disperse across the cell. So this process is called uh, hyper uh, process flow is called hyperpycnum flow, but this is not the classical turbidite. So. Still, there is a debate. Uh, this, there is a debate uh, uh, about the occurrence of, of the uh, self turbidite But here in Shanguilia, uh, they want to say that this is uh, this is uh, self turbidite But in the ocean part, we have the occurrence of um, deep water uh, turbidates. So I did uh, I did some petrographic uh, work on these uh, turbidites on onshore turbidite as well as some. Uh, as well as some um, turbidites from the offshore area, uh, Shangu Gashville. What I have noticed that uh, 
they are uh, uh, petrophysically they are not very well good quality result but um, uh, massive sandstone are very uh, are, are graphic type lot of matrix over there and uh, say massive sandstone uh, and uh, in uh, shangu gas field area this is so called thermites uh, uh, thermites are highly highly compacted and high content of clay content so so these are not very promising or uh, turbidites uh, in terms of hydrocarbon exploration point of view. But anyway, they are poor to moderate quality type of the That's all. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Dalal. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, there was a question that uh, how can a deep shipment vary inside build, let's say, four kilometers, four thousand meters? And uh, there are type turbidites, so or for that matter, any sedimentary rock, river uh, rock. If the, there is a reduction of porosity because, because of the dynamic loading, as you have uh, experience in diagenesis, how can there be some enhancement of porosity later on? Uh, Actually, 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 one uh, one MSc student did uh, did work on reservoir quality under my supervision on uh, on Shangu gas field, and uh, we collected core sandstone uh, core sandstone for, uh, from Shangu gas field, and uh, from our work we observed that this uh, massive sandstone are, are not as good as, uh, as supposed to be uh, very good quality reservoir. We found that lot of the lab, there are a lot of uh, clay content. And highly compacted uh, sandstone, but on the onshore uh, the turbidites, uh, they are gravity type sandstone. Lot of matrix, even more than 15 percent. So I can say that is poor to moderately type of uh, quality of sandstone reservoir, uh, turbidite reservoir. Not very promising. Not very promising. That's what I, that I want to say. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, contribution and. Uh, uh, if it is possible, uh, if I could have some questions from uh, some, uh, uh, if we could have some uh, comments from the uh, some Samadaja of this energy, can you un unmute him, please? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Sure. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Aminul Bhai and Julia Jalal Rahman sir, uh, respected Julia Jalal Rahman sir. Uh, I was listening to all these things, and I'm really glad to see some of our works has been presented by Islam, I mean, Islam Bhai. Uh, uh, for turbidites, this has been a lot of uh, debates, a lot, lot of discussions, even uh, uh, within uh, 50 years' time. And uh, we saw a lot of uh, presentations from uh, Aminul uh, Bhai. Uh, the simple understanding, what I can share with you, since I've worked in a very a different scenario. It was just a crater basin. And you will be surprised to know that an impact crater basin does have some turbidites. Because the turbidites is actually slope dependent. So it depends about what type of sediments has been carried and what is the working that has been done by the slope. So it could, I mean, if you think about the sediment gravity flows first, Turbidites is actually the end product of the sediment gravity flows. Yes, yes. So starting from the uh, avalanche, even avalanche flow is a sediment gravity flow. Then it goes to uh, uh, the debris flows. Then it is goes to hyper concentrated sediment flows and eventually uh, turbidate flows. So it is not always that we look for the deep sea turbidites, any turbidites, and that can be triggered up actually by the sediment flow, like you said if there are some sort of storms or even earthquakes, seismicity generation can also cause some sort of turbidites because your system has got agitated. So you got a lot of sudden discharge in the sediments and you got the evidence of the climbing ripples, which has been seen in the turbidites. Sometimes if the sedimentary uh, the flow is high, like you said, the hyperpicnal flows that you said. So actually the main challenge to determine that what type of turbidites is to look to the fossils and ichnophases, which is very important to tell what type of turbidites it is, because it can be generated even in a pond, even in a crater basin, or even in sea or river, whatever. And uh, in terms of reservoir qualities, obviously, the as you go to the distal part of the basin, 
especially yeah. in the deep seas. So, I mean, it's a challenge to find the sands. So look into the uh, porosity or permeability is the another challenge. The challenge is the next, but the first challenge is actually get the sands. So when we are working on SS level, actually we had to fight for getting the sands. And uh, 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 my colleague, Jabir, he worked more on that, uh, determine the seismic, uh, determine the sands from the seismics, which again, is a great challenge. And, but we didn't have any core over there. So actually we really can't work a lot uh, on that. But at the same time, I do had some experience of looking to this, uh, um, uh, the sites that has been shown by Amin Riz Kambai, especially of the Sue Basin, uh, King Ital, and also Hong Ital, that, that has been shown. And the challenge is over there that actually this is an area where you have a lot of compaction effects. So the sedimentary dikes forms very frequently, and you're all reserve of compartmentalization. Compartmentalization. So yeah, the challenge is that. Yes. So the challenge is that you find the sand first, then you look into the porosity vulnerability, then you look to the compactional effects. And so a lot of complexity is actually working in SS11. I can answer Moelul Islam's questions, but I'm not in that position to answer his questions because you probably know that SS11 has also been relinquished. And we worked a lot on that. So it was unfortunate that eventually you couldn't drill. But in my position, I cannot uh, tell or answer actually Moelul's questions, but we do have a lot of nice works that even we cannot show it because this block has been relinquished and it is confidential. So some of the things has been published in CPEX conference and we do have a lot of wonderful sites and it was our dream to drill over there, but eventually it didn't work. So thank you very much. Thank you for okay. uh, giving me Dr. the opportunity to share my experience. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, I think we are already one hour and 40 minutes and we have to call it a day. Uh, before that, I would like just to summarize what we got today. Uh, the presentation by Dr. Aminul Islam uh, with the theoretical part of turbidity currents and uh, turbidity sequences, followed by a property modeling of a field in New Zealand with all the petrophysical and uh, other parameters were excellent and uh, it gives us the insight to have uh, more work to be done in our country. But for that matter, we need good core data which is absent in our, sorry to say that coring in Petrobangla or is very small item and often it's not that properly of the interstitial. We need to have a protocol on say, coring uh, for which every well, especially the exploration and delineation of that for the matter, uh, any development well to have a good model and uh, then followed by our the comments by Dr. Julie Zalal with uh, examples in our, uh, our uh, facility in the offshore and onshore areas. Uh, we had a very lively debate on our uh, lively uh, contributions by our uh, uh, audiences. And uh, I think we will have more uh, session on turbidites of sedimentation in our country because we know that we have a huge sedimentation over a short time and that a lot of controls of controls lateral seals or vertical seals uh, that matters in our in the if you'd like to request Dr. Uh, uh, Nelson Park to conclude the session uh, and uh, Quality day. Thank you. Now, Hassan Before I do, uh, is there anyone from the audience any question? Because uh, we see a lot of uh, um, people are there. Uh, anybody has any other question before we end it? Actually, we have almost another 10 15 minutes, and Othello by Archudiri by they are here. They can also speak something. Ahad Nawaz is there. And also we have Abid Lodi who worked in Sangu field. So they have some insight. Uh, thank you, Monor, uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk. I, I've been keenly uh, listening uh, to the uh, presentation by Dr. Amin Islam. It was uh, quite detailed 
and broad brush of the uh, uh, deep water sediments of Bengal Basin and uh, contiguous areas of uh, Bengal Basin. Also, a uh, uh, general workflow described for the uh, reservoir modeling. Uh, what I want to point out is that um, uh, in Bengal Basin, the, the Tardidite or the deep water sediments that we talk about uh, is, is fine grained Tardidites. And in petroleum exploration, the fine grained Tardidites are not as uh, brilliant targets as uh, uh, the shallower water counterparts like the reservoirs that we are getting gas from. So the deep water target uh, so, or the deep water uh, sediments, uh, basin flow plan or slope fan and associated uh, reservoirs are, uh, uh, will have uh, definitely uh, reservoir quality issues plus um, the other uh, issue with petroleum exploration is to have uh, um, a proper uh, trap, trapping mechanism, charging mechanism. Um, I was in a CIPEX conference where uh, Dayu was presenting uh, their uh, sway field and there were lots of questions regarding the uh, source of the gas. Uh, they were not telling us uh, because at that time, they, they were afraid, I think 10 years ago or more than that, uh, they were afraid that uh, if they say it's biogenic, nobody will be interested uh, in the reserves because biogenic is, is not a conventional uh, big field reservoir. So uh, the, the, the source of the deep water sediments uh, for Bengal Basin is, is a critical uh, risk element. Trapping mechanism is also a big element because there are not, there are hardly any um, structures. So it will be stratigraphic, stratigraphic traps are uh, risky. And also the reservoir quality as uh, the targetized so deep water uh, reservoirs uh, in the Bay of Bengal are uh, what's that called, uh, finally, tarbidites. And I think one of the main reasons uh, why the foreign oil companies are not uh, risking their money in the offshore areas of Bangladesh because of these uh, uh, geological technical issues, politics is later because they knew that there are, they, they knew the uh, uh, PSC conditions uh, of Bangladesh and uh, understanding all the economics, they signed the, signed the PSC. So the only reason they left Bangladesh is, is technical and we have to understand this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abid Babi. So if we have another five or 10 minutes, uh, is there anybody to contribute some more? Yeah, this is a hard charge. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Shuntasen. Hello, we can hear uh, you. Okay. In, in terms of carbohydrate sedimentation, the present is key to the past. What do we know now? I mean, what kind of, uh, in the context of uh, modern, in the shelf slope configuration, what we are seeing now? Do you know any, have any idea of the current carbohydrate sedimentation in the Bengal, in the offshore? Bengal Basin, what's happening now? I mean, are all the sediments that has been transported are all depositing turbidites or is just losing into the slope, continental margin slope? Do you have any, any idea of the current turbidite sedimentation? Anyone? You are, uh, okay. Can I, can I just uh, respond to your question? Yes. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Hello. Bengal Basin, the shelf is very broad and gentle. If you have okay. a broad shelf, it's a madris. So most of the cases, Bangladesh part is right now is a madris. So you can uh, hardly expect sand right now uh, depositing our shelf, something like this. 
So maybe the paleo time, like uh, Miocene time, the depositional pattern was different. Yes. So we have to look for turbidites not the right time at modern time. Rather, we have to look for like uh, during uh, 10 million or five or six million years before. So right now the modern uh, shelf is muddy. So it's a Madrid's environment. Oh. Okay, thanks. If there is any more comments, uh, if there isn't any, then we'd like to conclude. I uh, not like right to conclude today. And sorry for the, the interruption. Um, I think it's, uh, moderation is not job of the novice. So from next time, the, uh, uh, the stream will be there. So sorry for some inconveniences and some of the problems associated with the network as well. Uh, but it was a lively session. Presentations were very nice. And uh, I think we will have more discussions on uh, deep water sedimentation in future. We have contributors, and uh, I would like to hand over, hand over to Narvai for his final comments and conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you, Manor. And thank you, all the audience, uh, for uh, attending the session. And it is very, it is a great presentation by Professor Aminul Islam. And um, I am sure the lot of information we can, uh, the student or the professional, geological professional, they can get it and uh, add to their knowledge. And it was a great, great presentation, no doubt about it. And uh, also Dr. Zule Jalalur Rahman for um, pitching in with some information. And thank you all so very much. And then the um, our uh, organizer, Monwar and Nazim, for their excellent job. Uh, Jashim is not here. He, he joined later, but he was a um, audience, definitely. I thank him. He was out of town. And uh, also, uh, I thank uh, our Zoom administrator, Aziz Rahman. And it was it was great and thank you so much. We will see you next time. Kuda Hafiz. Aski Potomra.